Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to our reporter nights here at Columbia University. I'm Steve Cohen. I'm Senior Vice Dean of Columbia School of Professional Studies and a professor at Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. I also direct several environmental master's programs at Columbia, and from 2006 to 2018, served as executive director of the university's Earth Institute. I'd like to first thank Claudia Dreyfus, our very own professor at the School of International Public Affairs and distinguished science feature writer for the New York Times for putting this virtual event together for Columbia students and faculty, as well as the general public. Claudia is also a lecturer in the Sustainability Management Program at Columbia's Earth Institute and School of Professional Studies, where she teaches a course called Writing About Global Science for the International Media. Tonight, Claudia will be interviewing Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and staff writer at The New Yorker, Elizabeth Colbert. Elizabeth Colbert is the author of The Sixth Extinction and Field Notes from a Catastrophe. Her research and writings have addressed and explored the difficult topics of wildlife extinction and the impact of climate change on cities. This evening, she'll not only discuss the inherent connection between the current pandemic and the destruction of the natural world, but share her thoughts on the immense responsibility that writers have to bring these difficult subjects to a skeptical audience. We're very excited to have Elizabeth Culver at Columbia tonight, and we're looking forward to learning more about her important work. With that, I'd like to hand this over to Claudia. Thank you for your kind words, Dean Cohen. And tonight, in the fourth live stream interview in the series, we're talking to Elizabeth Colbert from her home in Western Massachusetts. Good evening to you, Betsy. Hey, Claudia, good to see you. Good to see you. And good evening to my students out there um, and to the alumni of Columbia's remarkable Masters of Sustainability Management program that Steve Cohen founded. Uh, a lot of the alumni are out there, I, I see from our guest list, and it's good to see you. I wish we could be doing this in person. Um, but welcome everyone to Virtual Columbia. I'm sure that all of you out there know of Elizabeth Colbert's work in The New Yorker. She's the magazine's environmental and, and climate correspondent. And I hope she won't be embarrassed if I say that a lot of people have compared her to Rachel Carson, who wrote The Silent Spring at The New Yorker and really ignited the first environmental movement, which we're the second incarnation of these days. Uh, many people say that Elizabeth Colbert's books have had that, that effect on our contemporary times. So let me just say she's a former New York Times correspondent. She was the Albany Bureau Chief, which is a, a, a job that many people at the New York Times have found shall we say is challenging, but Betsy Colbert actually liked it. And uh, that's kind of what she did before she started covering environmental politics. Uh, so Betsy, I, I was wondering, where were you physically and in your head in early March of this year? What were you up to at that moment? Well, right as things um, were really uh, Right before everything shut down, I was actually um, in Cambridge, Mass, reporting, spent a week um, with some people at Harvard, just doing some reporting. And um, I, you know, was out and around with everybody going out to dinner, the things you usually do. And I, I remember thinking, you know, very, uh, with a lot of trepidation, you know, this is, this is all, it, it, somehow this is all not going to end well. And, uh, you know, maybe a week later, 10 days later, we were all, you know, ordered to stay at home. So it, it didn't really end too well, but here we are. Yeah, um, my response was a bit of the response of denial the first week. I thought uh, when Columbia shut down in the midst of an important section of my class, I thought, oh, damn it, what is this? They're overreacting, of course. Uh, when in fact, people were behaving very wisely and cautiously and I suspect the president of the university was listening uh, to his public health people who were saying, this is gonna be bad. But I'm, 
I'm wondering if you thought it was going to be as bad as it became. Well, I was in a weird, you know, a weird personal situation where one of my um, kids was actually in Italy. So I had a kind and of... And Italy was already very bad at that yes, point. Yes, Italy yeah. beat us by uh, several weeks, I'd say, maybe th yeah. three weeks. I don't remember exactly the timing. Um, and so I kind of watched this wave um, move th through Italy and, and Italy actually shut down, you know, um, uh, you know, maybe a week or two before we did. So I'd seen it, it coming, watched the Italian news very carefully because I was worried about him. Um, so by that point, it was pretty clear, I think, that we weren't going to av avoid this. There was pretty much no way that the US, I mean, unless there was some, you know, miracle uh, that we were going to not avoid that, the same thing. We were going to avoid that happening. So you didn't feel as many people did at the time. This is going to be a bad flu um, pandemic. We'll get over it. it it's it maybe an epidemic, but it's not going to be that bad. Not a pandemic. <laughs> you know, I'm not an epidemiologist. I don't want to claim any you know particular um, insight into into it. I, as I say, I you know I just watched. Uh, what happened in Italy. And as I said, the cases were mounting and the deaths were mounting. So, you know, the idea that this was somehow going to just, you know, quote unquote, solve itself, even if it is only a bad flu, to be honest, if, if everyone gets it and people have no immunity, uh, it's going to be uh, pretty devastating. Um, so I don't think I uh, ever felt like, oh, wow, we're just gonna, you know, waltz through this. How's that? Yeah, well, obviously there are a lot of links between the response to the pandemic and the way people have responded to climate change. And um, what do you think, based on your research over the years, both on mass extinction and on climate change, what is it about us as a species that makes it very difficult for us to accept these enormous calamities? Well, I mean, that's a, a really good question. And a lot of people have, you know, tried to speculate about that. And I suppose one, you know, line of reasoning would simply be we, you know, we're just not evolutionarily programmed for it. And um, Ed Wilson has this great line that we have, um, you know, pre prehistoric brains. We're really, you know, Paleolithic people who happen to find themselves in the 21st century. Uh, we haven't evolved, you know, very much since then. Um, we have medieval institutions, uh, and we have godlike technologies. And when you, you know, sort of put all of those three things together, uh, you're going to get some awkward situations, let's put it that way. Um, so I think our inability, you know, to see global problems coming at us, you know, one pretty, you know, maybe it seems a bit facile to say it, but I think nothing really having to do with human evolution is really that facile. It, it is a result of how, what skills we needed to survive, you know, 50,000 years ago, and they don't turn out to be necessarily that adaptive when we we ourselves have changed the circumstances under which we live so dramatically. Well, uh, as a species, I'm beginning to think we're much too optimistic for our own survival. Um, anything to that? Well, I guess that would be another, you know, kind of question to, to pursue. To ask Ed Wilson. To ask, to pursue with an evolutionary yeah. biologist. I mean, yeah. you know, is optimism, is thinking, you know, that uh, saber-toothed tiger, you know, that was the last one. I'm, we're never going to have to deal with that again. Uh, was that an adaptive trait? You know, did, did, did groups that uh, faced, uh, you know, up to um, what was, you know, the, the Paleolithic version of calamity and said, oh, we're going to, you know, buy gum, you know, this is just going to go away. It's just going to solve itself. You know, maybe they, they did better and here we all are. Uh, you know, 50,000 years later, uh, dealing with some stuff uh, that, you know, is, is um, global in scope. And I think that that is really what we have a hard time getting, getting our heads around. You know, if, if something is coming at us, that saber-toothed tiger, you know, we're pretty good at reacting. Um, but if something is very intangible, 
as you know the virus is you know we never see a virus uh we're, we're pretty bad at that well we we also don't see climate change um that clearly although many people tell us that we can see increased intensity in storms and uh, changes in 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 climate and in weather um last summer we we had heat waves in 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 europe and in alaska um and people but on the whole people did not accept climate change it seems to me because it seemed very based on math models it, it wasn't it wasn't until they saw a lot of manifestations of it that that they could accept it do you think this is something similar yeah absolutely i mean the, the parallels between you know people i can't remember who it was so i'm sorry to be quoting someone without crediting them but you know that um COVID-19 is, is climate change on speed. I mean, it has many of the same characteristics. It's something that we were warned about for quite a long time. I mean, there's a vast literature on the next pandemic. A lot of people predicted it would be a coronavirus because of um, the characteristics of coronaviruses. Uh, and there's an even vaster library on climate change, I would suspect. So both of these things are things that we've received you know scientific warnings from about for decades they are as i said they're not um the causes of them are not right in front of us you know carbon dioxide is you know we don't see it we don't smell it we breathe it out it's all around us so the fact that we're adding it to the air we don't sense that in a, in a sort of palpable way you know ditto with that virus you know those part of virus viral particles coming at you so it's kind of not something that's you know, directly in our faces. Um, there was a premium, obviously, on taking the science seriously and the and being proactive. In both cases, you know, we did not do that. Um, and so, and then also in both cases, we sort of have this misplaced. We, you know, it's become these camps where one camp is arguing, you know, we need to do X because of the economy, and the other camp is arguing you know, the, the economic damage in, in the long term of not taking the steps we need to take now is going to be much, much greater. So the, in all of these ways, the parallels are extremely uh, dramatic. It seems to be very striking. Now, one thing I should say, though, when we talk about, you know, people is these problems, as we see now from the graphs of COVID-19, they're not unique to the U.S., uh, but we occupy a particularly weird uh, and odd place considering that we are, you know, one of the most, if not the most technically advanced country in the world, uh, that we are not heeding these scientific warnings. If you look at, you know, both in terms of, of climate change and in terms of COVID-19, what's happening in Europe, uh, it's a pretty different story. Well, one of the things you did was go to Reykjavik, to Iceland in, in April, I guess? Uh, May. Uh, May. 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 Uh, the spring has just melted together in everyone's <laughs> brains. Nobody remembers time at all. Um, one of the things you did was uh, go to Reykjavik and look at a place where they had solved that. How did that idea come to you? Well, it came to me because I, just as all the you know proverbial shit was hitting the fan, I was supposed to go to Iceland uh, for a very different reason. Um, and my trip was canceled and I uh, really um, wanted to get there because I needed to do this reporting. Uh, and I, I, so I followed the news on coronavirus. It's like, when am I ever gonna get to go to, to Iceland? And as I was doing that, uh, they really uh, crushed the curve as it were. They were down to you know basically zero cases. And I thought, well, that, that's a good story is that um, a way that I could potentially get over there. And, and that is what happened. I had a lot of negotiations because they were not letting Americans in and they are still not letting Americans in. So we had long negotiations about that. Yes, I, in reading your story, which is archived on the New Yorker's website, people should read it. it, it it's first of all, a lot of fun, but it's interesting. And in reading the story, I, she has a scene uh, where Betsy's on a plane and she's feeling this great relief for getting out of the house and actually going somewhere, which is something we can all identify with. I mean, I kind of feel like if I'm 
gone to the supermarket. What an adventure. Um, but there you were. And what did you learn in Reykjavik about how to deal with this? Well, I mean, what they were doing there and, you know, people will say, you know, they're a small country. True. They're an island. True. Both of those things are true. Um, but they actually had a very high per capita caseload for uh, the month of um, April, March and April. Uh, they had a lot of people who'd come back in fact from Italy and Austria where, there, where COVID was circulating very widely. Um, so they did what, you know, they would tell you, they, they did what you're supposed to do. There's like a playbook, you know, for how you deal uh, with epidemics of infectious diseases. You know, every uh, hospital in this country, every public health institution has that playbook presumably on its shelf. Um, and we just did not follow it. You know, they followed it. What do you do? You try to find out as widely as possible uh, where this infection is. You try to isolate the people who have that infection. Um, and you try to trace all of their contacts. So they did all of the things, uh, you know, that, that we knew we should have done or should be doing right now and can't even get our act together after how many, you know, months uh, to do that. Um, so it was, as you know, they would say, uh, it's not rocket science. Um, the playbook was, you know, written doubtless by epidemiologists in the US. It just isn't that we haven't followed it. I interviewed you about five years ago for the New York Times. And at the time, you, you said something when we were talking about the destruction of biodiversity. You said, and this is a quote, it's not something we're doing because our species is greedy or evil. It's happening because humans are humans. Many of the qualities that made us successful, we're smart, creative, mobile, cooperative, well, maybe not, can be destructive to the natural world. You said that then. I, I'm wondering if the current crisis can be related to that understanding of humans being humans. And I'm not just talking about capturing bats and eating them, but ignoring bad and inconvenient information. Yes, I, I absolutely think so. And also, you know, I, I think that some of that, what I said there really applies here too. I mean, why, why are people, you know, um, why are we incapable, seemingly incapable of, of doing what we um, know we should do on, and part it's because we're such incredibly social animals, you know, and we don't want to sit home uh, and just um, be by ourselves. And so, you know, even as people know or should know, you know, that the risks of, you know, going to that bar or that restaurant are, are pretty high, uh, the, the draw of being with other people is such uh, that, that, that a lot of people are willing to face those risks and you know, then, then we get what we have now. Well, when you wrote The Sixth Extinction, uh, which won the Pulitzer Prize, by the way, the destruction you were describing for your readers was really quite far away. It was happening in tropical rainforests or in Australia and the damage for them was almost theoretical. But this is not I mean, there's a student in my class whose grandmother died. I know of seven people who've died in my wider circle. Uh, this is not theoretical, and yet people can't seem to, to grasp it. Very often, many people can't. Why do you think that is? Well, I think that that... <laughs> I, you know, I, on one level, I want to say, you know, your guess is as good as mine. Um, on another <laughs> level... I want to say, I think yeah. that, you know, COVID-19 really, you know, I've been thinking about that sort of question for, you know, quite a while, owing to writing about these big in, environmental and, and quite possibly sort of, you know, civilization undermining problems that we seem unable to get our act together to deal with, even in the, to be honest, in the slightest way. Um, and, you know, for a long time and because of you know there's a lot of misinformation out there about climate change and also because it is inconvenient to change your life to uh in ways that would 
be demanded by you know doing something significant to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. There are all sorts of reasons you could say, okay, that's why people don't want to believe it. But as you say, here we have you know pretty clear evidence that your own life is potentially on the line and the life of people you love, lives of people you love, uh, and people are still doing a lot of stupid stuff. Now, um, you know, part of it I want to say is it's hard to know at this point because our information is still is not great. What exactly is, you know, are the biggest riskiest activities? Uh, so I want to give people, you know, sort of credit for not knowing because it's simply hard to know. Uh, but, you know, there are certainly a lot of things we know are probably not a good idea that people are doing. And I think that uh, this is going to force people to really look at how the human mind, you know, does and does not deal with information that it doesn't like, because as, yes. as, we're, as you're suggesting, it's, it's potentially fatal. I mean, ignoring, you know, public health advice right now is potentially fatal. And yet we see this proliferation of, you know, bad information uh, coming out from the very, you know, highest levels of our government and people lapping it up. So what can I say? Well, what is your personal reaction when you see this? I mean, I, do you, can one resign from the human race? I mean, you know, <laughs> I quit. I, I don't think, <laughs> yeah, is that an option? I don't, no. I don't think so. Um, I think it's, you know, it's incredibly, uh, sobering. I mean, if you weren't already sobered by watching our response to these uh, slow acting, but as, as you're suggesting, se seemingly somewhat distant, I'm going to argue they're not distant. I'm going to argue, you know, the, the, the destruction uh, of the natural world and climate change, that those are not actually just removed from our everyday lives. But I, but for the sake of, uh, you know, argument, let's say they are, uh, here we're seeing something that is not, there's just no way to say that this is really removed from your everyday life. Uh, and yet people still find ways, you know, not to confront, um, you know, pretty, pretty basic um, facts. Let's, let's call them facts. Um, and that really, if that doesn't, if you don't find that sobering, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know what you do, what will, how's that, what, 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 what qualifies? Well, I'm wondering what you're working on from isolation. Um, a lot of people have uh, just, if we look at the New York Times, my phone rang too early, right. they, they can't stop. Uh, at, at any rate, a lot of New York Times journalists seem to be writing about whatever is happening in their midst, um, uh, which, which is, uh, People are writing about the experience of being locked down, about getting new pets, about uh, uh, getting uh, personal relationships in, with, within, uh, within their households. And interestingly, some of my students have been writing some really interesting pieces about things like having a baby in the middle of the pandemic or uh, losing your grandmother in the middle of the pandemic to COVID, or um, one student uh, moved in back as many did with their parents, and the kind of multi generational reflections that that brings. So that aspect, I'm wondering, what are you writing about, Elizabeth? Are you writing about what's going on in Williamstown? <laughs> oh man, I don't think that would be a very good story. Um, Why not? Well, because not much is going on in Winstown right now. I, I, I am in a position where I was actually, and that a little bit gets back to the Iceland story. I was just sort of finishing up reporting for a book. So I was kind of in a semi-fortunate position for a journalist in that I had a lot of material that I needed to um, write, you know, and not report. Um, Although I needed to get to Iceland to finish that, and did um, you uh, get your work done up there? Yes, I did. I did ah. what I needed to do. Uh, and but now, now that I am almost done working my way through that, um, I am really thinking about what to do next because you know reporters uh, got a report, and um, I will have to figure something out. I'll have to figure out uh, a way to go somewhere. Uh, interesting and maybe uh, 
probably you know not by myself because that's not reporting really right. but um i i i'm i'm trying to figure that out along with everyone else yeah well you know facebook keeps torturing me by with their section called memories and there are all these pictures of going to the galapagos or cuba or 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 the american south where i often go and it's just torture. <laughs> I don't, I barely get to the supermarket anymore. And why do they keep reminding me? Um, in any case, let's, let's throw this out to the students from writing about global science for the international media, which is the name of my course. And uh, 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 Ben Ram Chat Ritar, I, I will get to properly pronounce your name by the end of the semester. You had a question. Could you ask it, please, Ben? Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering, uh, how can we keep attention and momentum on climate change in the midst of the pandemic? That is a good question. Um, I think it's really hard, to be honest, um, because uh, the pandemic, you know, just sucks all the oxygen out of the room. Um, but I think that, you know, a lot of people are, you know, there's going to be a lot of money spent um, to keep economies afloat here in the States and in Europe uh, and probably in, you know, a lot of other countries as well. And I think that it, it, every one of those moments is a, you know, sort of moment to try to intervene, to try to make sure that, you know, money is going to projects that are going to you know reduce climate change as opposed to exacerbate it now that being said i i don't think that has you know happened so far in the us i think you know a lot of money has gone to some pretty bad uh stuff and we're you know we'll only know when all the accounting is done you know how how bad that was but you know definitely there are a lot of people thinking about how can we use this moment uh, of, of just incredible government spending to try to put forward infrastructure projects that will have long lasting positive impacts. Um, and, you know, if there's some, anything that, you know, anyone wants to do from, you know, sitting at home, uh, probably, you know, getting involved in those campaigns to keep congressional attention focused on this uh, would be a good idea, but it's an uphill battle given the uh, government we have right now. I'm not gonna lie to you. Okay, Deborah Winter, a student in the class and a neighbor of mine. Uh, you had a question. Are you there, Deborah? I think we've lost Deborah, so let's... Oh, I can unmute. I'm here. Yes. <laughs> ah, well, so ask your question, please. Okay. Uh, in field notes from a catastrophe, you wrote uh, that some people that advise you that despair is rarely helpful. And yet your writing um, tends to be very direct. And I, I want to know how you decided to stay that course despite the trend in the science community to soften the language around warming and climate change. Um, you know, that's a kind of a interesting one. I, I don't have a great answer for that. It's sort of um, almost um, something that I wouldn't say it was like a conscious choice. Like, you know, I'm going to keep, you know, uh, hammering at this while you all, you know, sort of drift into this idea that, well, we we need to be more hopeful. I mean, I, I come from a, you know, good old, as Claudia said, I reported on, you know, state politics for a long time before I reported on climate change. And I definitely come at this from the perspective that a reporter's job is to sort of, is to tell the truth. And, um, you know, if things were getting better, I would report that. And if they're getting worse, I report that. And unfortunately, climate change uh, is something that you know, even when things are quote unquote getting better, like, you know, right now emissions are way down, but carbon dioxide levels are going to continue to climb because that's just the way the system works. So it's pretty hard, uh, despite the best efforts of a lot of people, 
uh, to find, you know, the happy story here. And um, I, but I wrestle with that a lot. You know, I do, I, 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 you know, what, what is the, what are people able to sort of even take in at this point? Nicholas wrote, wrote a letter. Um, you have a question. Would you like to ask it? Yes. It, is there a specific climate change technology or theme we should prioritize with urgency given your research and experience? Well, I mean, we are so deep into this and we are so, yeah, we need to do, uh, you know, we need to really dramatically cut emissions. I don't want to claim, you know, to know, you know, what technology we should be using to do that, but, you know, there are uh, the obvious ones, you know, solar pa panels, solar PV, solar power has come down really radically in cost and so has wind. So, you know, those are possible, uh, pretty obvious uh, options. Um, but even that, you know, increasingly, uh, you are going to be reading uh, is is not enough, and a lot of people are looking for technologies. How are we going to actually, you know, try to take carbon out of the air? Um, and that is going to be a very interesting, you know. So far, we haven't done step one, which is stop putting it up in the air. But if we were to, you know, make dramatic strides in that direction, which I certainly hope we will, we will then be confronting the fact that we actually that's not enough and that we need to you know go the next step and and get rid of um somehow get out of the atmosphere what we've already put up there and that that's that's tough that isn't easy to do but once again it's probably not impossible um john trevellini who's a member of the class from the school of the arts we have students in the class from various columbia schools he is in addition to being someone interested in sustainability he's also a stage manager and a playwright so john has a question john where are I, you i'm here <laughs> yes uh, and you you're here at the matterhorn I, I, I know, right? <laughs> yes exactly um, <laughs> um I, I was just curious, you spent your career writing about science and technology and, and the folks working in these fields. Um, with all you know now, if you were to go back in time and choose to work as a scientist or engineer, which discipline would you choose and why? Well, I, that's, a, <laughs> that's a good question. I'm not much of an engineer, unfortunately. Um, but I always, when I, you know, when I talk to young people and I, and I say, look, if you have any uh, engineering talent, um, you should be looking at a career in some aspect of uh, clean energy, you know, cause there's, that is going to be, um, that's where the jobs of the future are. I, I, I genuinely do believe that, um, you know, we may not be moving fast enough or, um, uh, with, with enough urgency, but I do believe we will, you know, slowly but surely, you know, realize that we need uh, a whole new energy infrastructure. And so there's going to be a lot of uh, work to be done in, in both in, you know, infrastructure planning and in, you know, simply the, the technologies uh, of, of, of delivering energy. Thank you. Um, Joaquin Rosas, a student in our class, a sustainability student from Chile. Joaquin, your question. Hi, yeah. Um, do you think there will be a next COVID-19 if there are no significant changes in how we treat the environment? Well, you know, once again, I'm not, I, I am not someone who's written, you know, widely on, you know, viruses or epidemiology epidemiology, but I, you know, I will say that, uh, you know, we've had several dry runs for this, you know, SARS and MERS and things that for uh, whatever reason, we were fortunate enough never became, you know, sort of global pandemics. Um, so, but what I think that the, you know, ex experts, as it were, would tell you is, yeah, absolutely, we're gonna, ha we're gonna get, you know, the next one is, is, is just, is just coming down. Uh, it's just only a matter of time um, because of the ways that we, and there are a lot of factors uh, that go into this and, you know, the ways that we 
live in close proximity to a lot of animals. We increasingly are encroaching on, um, you know, territory of a lot of species. A, a disease may make the jump from our domesticated species. Um, and we are incredibly globally mobile. And that's, that's really what COVID-19 showed, right? It could show up in one part of the world and be everywhere uh, basically within two months. Uh, so that is a recipe for a global pandemic. And so we've, you know, we've, we've got all the ingredients and we're just always waiting for that one little spark uh, you know, to make a cake and we, we finally got it with COVID-19. And that doesn't mean that we're not gonna get it again it doesn't make it any more or less likely that we will get it again, but you know, the the ingredients are all are all there unless we really radically change the way we do business. Well, that's that's very depressing news. Um, Jasmine Shahidi uh, Wardani, who is the TA for the class, has a couple of questions, um, but we'll 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 take one. Okay. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, I'm wondering what unique ethical questions and challenges you encounter in your work on the climate are and how you go about navigating them. Wow, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I suppose you could say that it is, a, you know, well, I wouldn't say it's unique. I don't know that there are any unique challenges. I mean, whenever you are dealing with um, an issue that, uh, you know, when you put out there in the wider world, it, it, it obviously makes a, a difference how people respond to it, right? So news reporters, you know, as I said before, you know, we are the sort of ethos is look, you know, we report, you decide truly, you know, not the BS version of that, but we we put the facts out there, and you, as a reader, have to make your decision about, you know, how you respond to those facts. Now, when the response um, of your readers, who are admittedly, you know, always going to be a very small subsection of the global population, makes a difference to, you know, whether the human race will survive, for example, or whether some species will survive. Um, you know, the stakes are, are higher and should you, um, but you know, that's, that's true of a lot of issues. I don't want to say it's unique as that, um, because there's a lot of, you know, life and death issues out there for a lot of people and for a lot of organisms. Um, you know, do you have a responsibility, and this sort of gets back to the first question, you know, to, you know, take into account when you're writing what the impact of that is going to be, right? How people are going to respond. And I think that these are really interesting and important questions, but I think they're very, very, very difficult to answer. So it does propel you back to, well, I'm going to just report the facts and you know let the cards fall where they may, because I don't think there's any really good evidence uh, that you can anticipate how people are going to respond now. If I were presented with that evidence, uh, then I would be in a more complicated ethical position. How's that? Well, you know, within covering climate, there's been a long debate on on how you deal with climate deniers, and many in the media have decided that uh, balance isn't adequate uh, ethically uh, to 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 at least cover this issue that it's not an equal thing. And um, how do you feel about that? Oh, I, I mean, I completely feel, you know, that issue of false balance. I think that that is, a, you know, a very peculiar issue. I mean, it's like, as if when you were covering COVID-19 and trying to find out, uh, you know, what, uh, treatments work you you know as donald trump for example no you um you know you went to some you know crackpot and said what you know who's hawking some um you know patent medicine what do you think the best treatment for for covid19 is we in the journalism world would not consider that you know to be uh an acceptable practice right you know when you are doing a, a piece 
on an issue that requires some technical understanding, you really need to go to the people who actually have that technical understanding. So that issue with climate change was sort of created, I absolutely think, by a very smart you know, group of politically motivated people who you know, ins managed to convince, really, to be honest, organizations uh, like the New York Times that they ought to be consulted uh, on these issues when they really had no credentials. Um, so fortunately, we've gotten beyond that uh, for climate change. Uh, and I think, you know, I wrote a series about climate change back in 2005. Uh, and I wrestled with that at the time, uh, what to do with these people. And I ended up, and this was like a 30,000 word series, uh, completely leaving them out. There's just, there was just no point uh, in entertaining you know, wrong information, <laughs> that's really not our job when we know uh, something to be wrong, in well, my view. You see a lot of parallels to that in the coverage of COVID. First of all, uh, you know, with all sympathy for reporters who are working in the field, all, often the reporters covering COVID are not science reporters, but political reporters. And when they get garbage thrown at them, they don't have the skills to, to kind of deal with it um, and, and to, to sort through it. I, I'm sure that everybody in the White House press corps, when they heard that injecting Clorox would be a good idea, knew that that wasn't very, you know, you, you don't need a lot of science skills to know that. But were they capable of dealing with the idea of chloroquine? Um, uh, yeah. Well, I think um, that's a good question. I, I don't. I don't know. And I think that, you know, that was a very, you know, we're in this media, just extremely bizarre media landscape. And that sort of gets back to this question of, you know, is the human mind, you know, capable of, of dealing with a situation like this? And, you know, where you uh, have one, you know, pretty substantial part of the media, what I will call the media, you know, um, passing off pretty bad information uh, as fact, um, you're going to get some really bad results. And, you know, lo and behold, uh, that's where we are. Uh, well, <laughs> let's throw, I, let, let's also bring some of uh, our, 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 I wouldn't say viewers, our Zoomers out there uh, in Zoom land into, um, into the discussion. Some of them have sent us some questions in advance and some of them are really quite fascinating. Um, I, I, there's someone out there named Tara Halle who asks, uh, she's a guest and she asks, what are the biggest mistakes you're seeing in journalism covering COVID and how can they be addressed? That's a good link into our last question. Well, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, I think that there's, you know, I, I do want to say, and I, I do want to give um, a lot of people um, a lot of credit. There's a lot of, you know, really good information out there. And this is a very fast moving, fast changing story. Um, now, you know, in terms of developing treatments, in terms of developing vaccines, it's a pretty technical story. Um, and so I think a lot of people are doing, uh, you know, are doing really good reporting. I think that, you know, one of the things that's been sort of weirdly lacking and reporting, I think, often, you know, follows the political agenda. And that is, you know, one it was one of the big problems for climate change for a long time when there was no conversation about climate change in political circles. Uh, it was hard for reporters to generate that conversation. And I think that now in terms of COVID, you know, this sort of complete absence, which we're, we're seeing of a, of a strategy for how any of these, um, how do we actually get from A to B? You know, how do we open our primary schools? All sorts of things like that. Uh, you know, people are definitely, uh, you're definitely reading stories about that, but I think that we could see a lot more Reporting, and maybe we if we saw better reporting, you know, sort of on what it would actually take to do some of these things safely, you know, maybe that would actually um, move this conversation forward a bit. So, so I do think there's a lot of good reporting out there, but I also, 
do think that um, th there's also a lot of uh, sort of short-term reporting and not as much long-term reporting, I guess, as I'd like to see, like, what, what is this going to look like in a couple of months? And, you know, there's a lot of, uh, that depends on our behavior, but there's also a lot that we could be thinking about. Well, about the vaccine coverage, uh, do you think it's been good? A lot of it seems to me, uh, you know, a hope and a prayer. Absolutely. I mean, I think there's a lot of wishful thinking and it's sort of like, you know, a race for vaccine and it's a good story. And, you know, maybe we will be, um, you know, all, you know, pleasantly saved. deprived, saved, exactly. Uh, but, you know, there are uh, a lot of, a lot of hurdles um, between now and then and you know one one question and I you know I read coverage of this so I don't want to claim any knowledge of it that I didn't read from media coverage um, but I don't think it was in a big publication I can't remember where it was that you know we're not seeing people developing long-term long-term antibodies if you're not developing long-term antibodies then a vaccine uh, uses the same you know um, systems that the virus itself uses, right, to produce immunity. Uh, if your body doesn't produce antibodies that last for a long time, then a vaccine is going to, they're going to have a really hard time uh, producing a vaccine of the sort that we want that provides permanent immunity. It might be something that just provides, you know, partial immunity or, or temporary immunity. So these are all questions that you know, definitely have yet, yet to be answered. And, and we probably should be seeing more coverage of those too. Um, a lot of the vaccine coverage uh, is stuff that I was taught one shouldn't do. For instance, you should not be reporting on studies in phase one, or you should not be reporting on studies that have very few people in them. Or, uh, and yet these studies have reached the front page. Uh, I keep hoping it means that somebody knows something I don't know, but yeah, that's that's kind of optimistic, Claudia. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think you know this is you know on some level unprecedented, and so you're going to see unprecedented things happen in the coverage, uh, even in very well, you know, thoughtful and well intentioned coverage. Um, so, you know, are we going to see a lot of studies being touted that, you know, probably uh, don't deserve the kind of coverage that they're getting? You know, yeah, absolutely. But the hunger for something that moves this story forward, you know, is so great that I don't see news outlets avoiding that. And I now get, you know, I get um, yeah. alerts from science, you know, about the latest yeah. COVID papers that they're that they're about to publish. So everyone's rushing stuff uh, into print. And that is true both in terms of the scientific publications and in terms of the mass media. Our former colleague, Bruce Lambert, had a question that he wanted to send you. He, he says, a question for the extraordinary mm -hmm. Betsy Colbert, whom I had the pleasure of working alongside in room nine decades ago before she was famous. Uh, he says, I'd like to think that it's far better to strive heroically to slow, possibly arrest, and ideally reverse the Earth's unfolding environmental disaster rather than do nothing. But in my heart of hearts, Bruce says, I fear that we're already past the tipping point and at best can only slow the inevitable a little. He wants your judgment, please, he says. Okay. Okay. Hi, Bruce. Um I think that, uh, you know, there's not one tipping point when it comes to climate change. It's not like we get here and everything changes. There are many tipping points. There are many uh, phase shifts in the, you know, uh, and many um, different systems working on different time scales. So I think that you know, for better or, or worse, we never get to say, you know, it's too late. Uh, we always do have to, there's, there's always things could always be worse. And so while I think there's a lot of damage that's inevitable, that's um, pretty much a given at this point, 
uh, there's also a lot of damage that is not yet inevitable. And that is our job uh, uh, to prevent, to try to prevent, to do whatever we can to prevent. So um, I think that um, we don't, we don't, we don't get to, you know, we're not, we don't get off the hook um, and we have to, it's not just on a hope and a prayer. It's, uh, you know, the, the basic facts of the situation are that uh, it's not either all or nothing. There are many, many, um, you know, every, every degree matters, every half a degree matters, every quarter of a degree matters. Uh, I don't quite want to say every ton of carbon matters, but you know, every gigaton of carbon matters has that. Uh, and, and we really need to do uh, all we can to try to uh, minimize that. Um, you know, we're late in the day though. There's no doubt about that. Now, a, a guest wrote in, a guest with the extraordinary name of James Wilberforce, I can't believe this is his real name, uh, with the following question. Are we doomed? <laughs> well, on an individual level, the answer is always yes. We are yes. all, you know, always, always yes, doomed. Um, you know, I, I, you, we always get like, uh, you know, after I wrote the sixth extinction, I got all these questions. You know, like, oh, you know, are we going extinct? You know, and I mean, on some level, the answer is, once again, yes. Like in the great uh, history of uh, life on earth, you know, there's no species that's still around that's been around forever. So yes, one day, you know, humans, Dallas will also go extinct. But, you know, is our extinction on the horizon? Uh, you know, not not at all necessarily. Um, you know, we're we, we, it's quite possible that we could do in, you know, just you know, many, many, you know, half of the species on earth and still be okay. We're, we're really, really, you know, clever and we're really good at manipulating our environment. Um, so I think that, you know, uh, rumors of our death are greatly exaggerated, it has that, um, but that doesn't mean that uh, there's not a lot of bad stuff uh, that can happen, uh, you know, between between now and then, you know, it, there's a big gap between extinction and life continuing on as it as it is today with almost eight billion people on the planet. So there's a lot of wiggle room uh, in there. Speaking of wiggle room, we have a little bit of time, so I'd like to go back to one of Jasmine Vajani's questions. She's a recent graduate or is about to graduate from the School of the Arts, and she writes uh, literary nonfiction. And you had a literary question. Oh, yes, I did. I was wondering um, what your favorite non-journalistic works dealing with climate are, or they can be movies or creative nonfiction <laughs> films. But... Dealing with climate. Um, wow, that's an interesting yeah. question. That is actually a really interesting question because um, a lot of people have sort of, you know, asked this question, where is the great? you know, work of art that's going to sort of, you know, where's the Dr. Strange of or whatever of, of climate change that's going to really um, capture the public imagination and uh, move this um, story, you know, into the general, you know, realm through, through some kind of, you know, not, not reporting, but through some kind of artistic expression. And I, I think that hasn't happened yet you know there have been some good um there's been a lot of you know novels that have either touched on it or kind of um which i liked i liked you know weather uh by uh jenny ophiel oh, i don't know how she pronounces her last name ophiel i guess um uh odds against tomorrow by nathaniel rich i think is a fun book um so i think that there are a bunch of novels that are uh that are good and I, I i'll think of more as soon as uh this is over i'll, I'll email them to you but uh, but i don't think we've gotten that sort of breakout work i mean that's going to really uh that's really captured a really big audience well is there something about the topic that makes it inherently difficult i, I know that in the 50s and even early 60s 
the idea of nuclear holocaust was dealt with in a literary way. You had On the Beach, you had a whole series of movies uh, that were very striking, including Strange Love, but sort of end of the world movies. There was one where Harry Belafonte is like the last man on earth walking around an empty New York and people dealt with it. Why can't we deal with this now? Well, I mean, I think that in terms of I mean, there's sort of two questions. One is, you know, why aren't those, you know, works of art? And I'm not sure that the Harry Belafonte movie, which I don't know what it is, but anyway, there obviously were some great- I think it was you know, also called <laughs> Odds Against Tomorrow. Oh, really? right? so. Well, I mean, On the Beach is a great oh, yeah. book and, you know, Dr. Strangelove is my absolute favorite um, movie. So, I mean, there were, I think that you know, nuclear, nuclear war, which is a really, you know, war itself is a great, um, you know, has always been a great uh, subject for uh, books and for literature and for movies. It's, 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 it's acute, you know, it happens, uh, it comes at you uh, and it's very dramatic, right? Whereas climate change uh, is sort of everything, uh, and nothing at the same time. I mean, even when you have a very dramatic event that's clearly been uh, influenced for significantly by climate change, like you know a hard superstorm Sandy, or what you know you choose it, you name it, the fires in Australia. It's never you know directly you can never say this is directly caused by climate change. So you have that sort of attribution problem. Your your protagonist, as it were, is not an an actor, and it's not some evil actor either. It's you know, it's, it's everyone. The, the responsibility is so diffuse for climate change. So I think it just doesn't narratologically lend itself very easily uh, to you know telling a great story. And that has been, I think, and you'd have to add, you'd have to get some movie producers and some novelists in here. Uh, but I think that that has really stymied people. And the, and uh, I don't someone's going to have to come up with a very clever solution to that. How's that? Yes. Well, we, I, before I asked you a closing question, two things. Um, will you hang around for about 15 minutes to interact with the students after sure. we're done? Let me ask you a closing kind of question. Uh, when we first began, you, you were talking about what you were working on when, you know, the March bomb hit our lives. Um, what are you working on now? Well, I'm I'm trying to finish a book. <laughs> How's that? Is this a good atmosphere yeah, for yeah. finishing the book? I mean, nothing to it distract is. you. Um, well, actually, it it kind of it kind of you know, I mean, I I want to say that it it kind of has been, uh, yeah, everything got canceled. Everything as of March got canceled, so I had nothing to do but write these books. I have no excuses. How's that? And um, how's it gone? Is it going? Um, it's 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 going. You know, it's not it's not done yet, but it's going. Can you tell us a little about it? Yeah, it's about. Um, <laughs> it's sort it's, of like asking a novelist yeah. what's your novel about. It's, uh, it's about a lot of these questions that we've been talking about. It's about you know where where do we where do we go from here? Having mucked around with a lot of different uh, biological and 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 geochemical systems, what what are we going to do to try to uh, get out of this mess. How's that? That's what it's about. Yeah. Well, uh, in in closing, what has the crisis done to you? I, I know that in my own life, uh, every time I go out, I turn into a greater misanthrope than I ever was. <laughs> I mean, sort of the anti Anne Frank. Anne Frank said, despite everything, I still believe that people are good. Every time I go out in the street, I see these confirmations that people are not being that good. And I think, what? Um, how has this affected you? Well, I, 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 that's a good question. I mean, I do think that it has really um, caused me, it, not that these were not questions that I wasn't thinking about, um, but it really has made me think pretty despairingly, how's that, about, you know, what will it take uh, for people to come to grips with, you know, what, what you're describing as some pretty uncomfortable making and in, inconvenient information. And as we were discussing before, if you can't, 
if, if people are able to do that, um, able to keep that information at arm's length, even when their own lives are at stake, uh, it, it's hard for me to imagine how we're gonna how we're gonna have a constructive conversation about something like climate change. So that has been very sobering and 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 dispiriting. Has that. Um, so I don't know if it's, it's been so much for me, the question of, you know, are people, I still believe that people are basically good, which is a line I think about a lot too and mull over in my mind. Yeah. Um, but whether, you know, we're just equipped to deal with, this gets sort of a little bit back to our, you know, the evolution of our brains. Are, are we equipped to deal with these situations that, you know, would never have occurred uh, to our, to our ancestors, they, they just wouldn't have happened. So we wouldn't have had to deal with them. Well, on that note, thank you, Betsy. And um, we'll reconvene at some point, maybe when there's better news and in person. <laughs> and, as, as, uh, as the Hebrew prayer goes, uh, next year in Jerusalem, I say next year out, outdoors. Out a of big your park. apartment. Yeah, right, yeah. right. Yeah. right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And, oh, and we We'll, we'll meet uh, with some of the students immediately after this. To our friends out there, thank you for joining us too. Next week, Margaret Sullivan talking about the ethics of journalism and where journalism is in this age of COVID. Thank you for joining us.